Hey Shutter Clickers! How you doing? Glad you could join me this week. This week's lesson is going to be about composition. But before we get into that, let's review next last week. Oh, 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 wait a minute, honey. You said that you wanted to do these in five minute sections. And last week it went kind of like 13 or plus. So maybe you shouldn't do the review. And if we wanted to review, we could always look back at the first lesson on our own. Yeah, I think that's a good idea that she has there, Shutter Clickers. So let's just get right into today's lesson. Let's go to the computer. I'm going to show you some pictures and I'm going to talk you through composition. All the rules of composition. We're going to discuss uh, probably six different six different rules. i got to get my right fingers up here. Six different rules of composition. Get it right. Get it right. Six different rules of composition. They're not really rules. They're just guidelines on how to take that subject, put it into your picture to where you, it becomes a photograph. Something that has interest, uh, it gives interest to the subject, but not only interest there, but interest to the picture as a, as a whole. So uh, let's quit talking and let's get right in. The, uh, the, the video is not going to be going, I'm going to do voiceover. So you're not going to see me anymore. You don't need to see me to learn composition. You need to see pictures and what to do. So let's get right at it now. That sounds real interesting. The most common composition guideline is the rule of thirds. It's probably the easiest to understand. All you do is picture your scene as being covered by a tic-tac-toe board and place the subject on one of the crosses. As you look in the picture there, you see the tic-tac-toe, you see the red X's or the red crosses. That's where you want to put the subject of your picture. So let's take a look at some pictures where we have used rule of thirds to compose our setting. In this picture from last Christmas, you see that front golden globe is right on the cross. But the problem with this picture is we're zoomed in so tight that we lose the context. Now if we zoom out a little bit, broaden our picture, we're still right on the cross, but now you get a context for what the whole picture is all about. You can see the shrubs in the background, more globes in the background, and the snow falling in the picture. Much, much better picture. Here you see me hunched over doing something, but there's no rule of third here, so there's no context here. You can't see what I'm doing. If we change the picture just a little bit, move me on the rule of thirds, now we can see what's going on. You get the context, you get the look that I'm doing something much, much better, much stronger picture. Here's a common error of the rule of thirds. My granddaughter here is on the, the rule of third line, but she's on the wrong side. She should be on the other rule of third, therefore giving her space to move into. Here she has no, way, no place to go, no way to go. Just fall off the edge of the picture. This picture is really a very good picture in that it shows the busyness of boating so you have strong context and my wife is right on the third line and so your eye is drawn to her also being on that line she has room to move into room to work into if she was over on the very edge or the very bottom in the center you probably wouldn't even know she was there the next composition technique is called leading lines. The idea is to draw your eye through the complete picture to the subject. In this next picture here we see the road as being the leading line. Your eye will naturally want to travel from the bottom center where the road starts all the way around to the back edge drawing your eye through the complete picture. Here's another boat picture. Here we have myself and Kathy standing on the third but the boat, the dock, and even the, the boom on the mast there all are strong leading lines taking you back to us. Lots of context, strong lines, great picture. This picture was shot with my phone on a scouting mission. We're trying to find some good scenes to shoot. The railing in the front there becomes a strong leading line. And I wanted to show you this, not that it's a great picture, but the contrast. I turn around and I take this picture without a leading line. And all of a sudden, it just falls flat. 
the leading line not only leads your eye through the picture, but it gives depth to the picture. Here you see the contrast between the two pictures. The picture on the left has much more depth with the leading line than the picture on the right without the leading line. In this picture, the leading line doesn't draw your eye to the subject, but it's necessary there to give depth to the picture. The leading line, of course, is the railroad tie. This is probably one of the strongest leading line pictures I have. It's just a great shot. The road gives great depth to the picture. It's got great color, great sky. Uh, you know, what more can be said? It's just a great picture because of the leading line. Here, the subject is the leading line. It's just a natural shot. Most people take a picture of this building standing directly in front of it. But I think it loses a lot of the dynamics of the building that way. Here's a shot of a road, an abstract shot, in the wintertime with the shadows on it. Because of the road, your eye can't help itself but to follow the road all the way to the back of the picture. Makes for a strong, strong leading line. Framing is a technique used to make the subject the strongest part of the picture. It's like having a picture within a picture. Here I'm at Pettigene State Park, and I'm standing in the breezeway of the lodge and I'm using the pillars of the breezeway to frame the mountains in the background thus giving me context as to where I am. Here's the same picture only I'm standing out in front of the pavilion. It makes a nice shot. Notice how the two mountains on the right and the left give a leading line back to the sunset but without the pavilion it's a nice sunset picture but there's no context as to where I am. Really, you want both pictures to go together. Here's a picture of the Oak Alley Antebellum Mansion. I shot with a point-and-shoot camera many, many years ago. But you got strong framing with the trees. But you also, the trees form a leading line as well as a sidewalk. So I just made a really great picture. I'm just sorry I didn't have a better camera and didn't know enough to make the picture straight. It's kind of crooked. Here's the same mansion, only I've zoomed in a lot closer. I zoomed with my feet, by the way. Always the best way to zoom. Zoom with your feet, not with the lens. But you see the framing of the trees to draw your eye to the center of the picture. Made a nice shot. And again, that shot with an old point and shoot many years ago. And it's not level. Sorry. Here's a picture overlooking Lake Lago. And it's framed by the trees. Fortunately, the tree on the left is bigger than the trees on the right, so it adds some balance to the picture. Made a pretty nice shot. This is a picture at Rocky Mountain National Park. This is a picture almost everybody was taking. I think they took it because they could stop alongside the road and just get out of their car and snap away. But it's really not that good a picture. It shows the mountains. It has a little foreground interest, but it's just not that good a shot. It needs something more. I moved into the woods about 100 yards and I was able to get this picture. Uh, the trees on the right kind of form a leading line, but that's still not the picture that I wanted. There's just still something missing. And now I took this picture. I moved back about 50 yards and I took this picture. Great foreground interest. You got the framing of the tree on the left, the framing of the tree on the right, and you've got the leading line of the trees going back towards the mountains. Uh, the horizon's perfect, sharp and clear all the way through. Just a great, great shot. I really love this picture. Centering is probably one of the most abused techniques of amateur photography. And the best rule of thumb there is use it only, and I say only, when there's nothing else you can do or when the background is so distracting that it's absolutely necessary to use centering. Here the waterfall is the picture. The fact is the background is rather ugly. It's just a, a jungle of distraction. Not necessary at all to the picture. Here I put the boats right in the center because centering often gives a sense of peace to the picture. It kind of anchors the subject right in the center of the picture. It doesn't allow for motion of any kind. Notice the pun, anchor. Anyway, moving on. Notice also the leading lines of the reflection of the mast leading back to the boat. I thought it was a real good picture in that it, it does give you that sense of peace and serenity. 
Here's a picture of the aspens in Rocky Mountain National Park in full color. The aspens are the picture. You don't want to add anything to the picture to distract from the aspens. Here again, the trees are centered and it gives a sense of foggy, mystical, mysterious, uh, peaceful serenity of the picture because the trees are anchored in the center. Notice also all the white negative, we call that negative space, the white around the tree. This picture was taken this spring at Garvin Gardens and there was one red tulip in this great big patch of yellow tulips. So I zoomed in and put him right in the center. He's such a pretty boy, he needed all the space he could get. Just made kind of a neat picture. Almost everyone wants to put the horizon across the center line of the picture. And that's normally, usually, almost always, I say almost because it's not always, but almost always the wrong thing to do because your eye doesn't know what to look at. Do I look at the foreground or do I look at the sky? You know, it, it makes for a confusing picture. Horizons should be either in the upper one-third or in the lower one-third of the picture. Upper one-third emphasizes the foreground. Lower one-third emphasizes the sky. So let's take a look at some pictures. This is Bear Lake at Rocky Mountain National Park. And you notice the horizon is in the top one-third of the picture. If it had been anywhere else, the mirror image, the reflection in the lake of the mountains would have been either unnoticed, uh, unseen. Uh, it would have taken a lot of the dynamics away from the picture. Also, you would have missed the rocks uh, to kind of anchor the picture in the foreground. Another Rocky Mountain National picture. Again, the horizon is above the center line. By having it that way, the foreground gives depth to the picture. It also makes the mountains look big and massive in the background. This is also Rocky Mountain National Park. And here I use the far, the far, F-A-R, far shoreline as the horizon. And by using that instead of the sky, it draws you into the picture, gives you a sense of actually being there, standing on the other shore, looking across the lake. This is a picture of Long's Peak in Colorado. And again, I put the horizon very high in the picture. And this gives a, a sense of depth as we walk across the foreground. It also adds to the, uh, the majesty, the, the, the largeness of the mountain in the background. I think we're afraid to use negative space because we want to cram as much as we can into every picture to get our money's worth. And that's just wrong-headed thinking. Sometimes negative space can be the most valuable technique we can use. Here's a picture of a pelican surrounded by nothingness. All you see is him and his reflection in the water. And that's all this good-looking guy needs to make a great picture. Just him and his reflection and a lot of nothingness surrounding him. Well, I have two more pictures I want to show you, and they're my most popular pictures that I've taken. This first picture was taken in Enos, Texas, of the Blue Bonnets when they were in full bloom. And I think the reason why it's so popular is because of the composition. Number one, the tree on the left has been isolated and it sets on the line of thirds. Number two, the sun is on the opposite line of the third, giving balance to the picture. And number three, the horizon is just above the center line. Lots of foreground, adding depth to the picture. I think it makes a great shot. This last picture has been my most popular picture. It was taken with a LG G3 phone. I walked out of a restaurant into the parking lot and the beautiful sunset drew my attention, but the flag with the sun shining through it was just an awesome picture. I think the subject is good. The flagpole is just off center, making a leading line up to the flag, which is in the center. And of course, the sun shining through it. The, it was obviously late. Uh, the sun had already really set, and so it's obviously very late, and the darkness of the foreground 
just added to a tremendous picture. This picture has been viewed almost 30,000 times on the internet with over 20,000 likes. So I'm real happy with that shot. And it was, it just brings up the old axiom F8 and B there that I told you about in the first video. Have a camera and being at the right place at the right time is of vital importance. Well, I know I've gone over my five minute limit but composition is probably one of the most important things you can do to have a good quality photograph. In, in past history, some of our greatest photographers were recognized not because they used light perfectly, not because of the subject matter was so great and dynamic, but just because they knew how to compose a picture. Uh, if you go back and look at some of the photographers from the 30s and the 40s that did a lot of street photography. You see that composition was everything to them. So, well, I hope you enjoyed this. And most of all, I hope you learned something. And these are, are simple, easy techniques that you can use. Uh, there, it's not, there's nothing hard here about this. You, know, you can just go right out. All you got to do is just stop and think for a minute. You know, how do I, how do I stand? Where do I stand? How, what do I look at? Where do I put the subject of my picture? That's called composition. So get out there and remember last week we talked about subjects. So pick a subject and take three or four shots of it, composing it different ways and see which one you like the best. I think that's the best thing you can do this week. So we're building that pyramid uh, of technique. And next week, uh, See, I forgot what we're talking Oh, light. Light is the subject for next week. That's one of the most difficult and one of the hardest to control. And so uh, we'll talk about that for a little bit. In the meantime, you know, get out there, keep your shutter clicking, and I'll see you later. Bye now.